today I'm with the author of Federal Pianist, Rufal Tales of the Only One, John Robuletti. Uh, John, before I get down to the questions, I have a lot that I prepared to ask you today. Can you provide me with some background information about yourself? I'm a pianist. I spent my whole life in front of a black box practicing to be a concert pianist. And uh, I played in 25, 26 countries around the world. I've been honored at the White House. And uh, I'm also a member of the Screen Actors Guild. As an actor, I've done 12 films. And uh, I've written, obviously, the book that you are going to talk about, and the short story also that was published on, in a literary journal. So, and I've also administrated. So those are the four things that I've done in my life. So those are four amazing things, but I really want to focus on um, learning more about you through the book that you created. How were you able to secure such a prestigious position in Washington, working with influential individuals at such a young age as a pianist? When I was a graduate student, I was studying with an artist teacher, a very well-known one in Los Angeles. I used to give private piano lessons for pocket money, and I used to go to their homes. And uh, one of them was a man, a businessman, who was quite wealthy. He lived in a a mansion in Holmby Hills next to the Bogart estate. And uh, I taught him lessons, but he never practiced. He was a funny man. He, I mean, peculiar in the sense that he was small, he had a large head. He was very abrupt, always in a hurry. He used mouth spray incessantly. And I just uh, did what I could with him and moved on. But he was kind of addicted to the lessons in a strange way. And uh, I could never figure that out because he didn't practice. And when I left Los Angeles years later for more study, he would track me down wherever I was. He'd want me to fly me back for a piano lesson. And one day when I had my first job, which was as a assistant professor of piano at a small university in uh, Podunksville, uh, he called again. And he said to me, I have been named chairman of the inauguration committee of the new president, Ronald Reagan, and I'd like you to play a recital at the inauguration. Well, there I was standing with the phone in my hand in my studio, which was about like a closet. And uh, I played the uh, concert at the inauguration and then about four months later he called me and he said I've been asked to head up by the president who I later found out was his best friend uh, he said uh, I, I've been named head of this big federal agency that reports to the White House it's responsible for all cultural presentations overseas plus broadcasting organs the Voice of America all the embassy blah 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 blah, blah. I didn't know anything about this it sounded very impressive and he said, why don't you come and take a look at the building on Pennsylvania Avenue? Now, that was code for see what you want to do there, you see. There was a plum, something in Washington called the Plum Book. It comes out every quadrennial exercise. And people go through it to get appointed to some job that's available. I didn't know anything about this. And in my naivety, I said to him, uh, look at the building. I said, I've seen buildings before. I don't have to look at the building. And that isn't what he meant at all. But anyway, what I what he really wanted was piano lessons. <laughs> well, that was a good way to give a piano lessons, right? From a long uh, answer to your short question. <laughs> but I, but I like it. I like how it got you um, into the White House. Uh, can you tell us the inspiration behind writing Federal Pianist? Well, what I went through, I mean, I, I just carried it around for a number of years, like an albatross or Atlas carrying the weight of, you know, uh, it was a searing experience. I was up to three packs a day and uh, there was alcohol at night at receptions at embassies and all this stuff. And people would pat you on the back with a meat cleaver and you didn't know who it was. And uh, you never knew what was around the corner. And uh, so I, when I left, I was so burned out, I couldn't 
I never wanted to wear a suit again, which was the uniform of the day or tie my shoes. <laughs> but when I got over that, I just felt this need to tell the story to the American people because it's so unique and entertaining, but also informative. And that, in a way, was a catharsis. It was like an exorcism. I got it out of myself. Does that make any sense? It does. And I like that you're giving it light because it's from your perspective of what you saw um, mm -hmm. inside the White House. What were some of the struggles and challenges you fa faced while writing the book? I didn't have any uh, struggles or challenges because I wrote about what I knew about. I just wrote about uh, my experiences. And uh, the funny thing was, uh, as explosive as some of it was, I, I would write maybe a, a chapter or so and send it to some friends. And they'd call me back and they'd say, this is funny as hell. I'd say, funny. So I just decided instead of doing a straight documentary or narrative, I would tweak the last two chapters because a novel needs an ending and, and market it as, as biographical fiction. But it's, it's all true except for the last couple of chapters because I needed an ending. And, you know, talking about experience, could you share a memorable experience or anecdote from your time as a pianist, giving lessons with White House clearance during the Reagan administration? Well, that's that's actually why I was brought in, but I never did give him lessons. Um, not until the last few days of the administration, I finally went over there. But I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. Instead, I wrote, wrote up a, a proposal for this cultural exchange program revolving around music. And I said, Let, let's do this. You know, there were people, there were 52 political appointees and, and some of them were sitting in big offices because they had what's called political godfathers that gave them a job like some big welfare state and they had nothing to do. And I didn't want to be like that. And so I created this program it, and I did, I, again, I was naive. I didn't know you can't do that in the federal government. I had no budget. I had no staff. And yet we did it against tremendous odds. And people were trying to kill us. The bureaucracy believes, you know, oh, let's do it this way because it's always worked that way. We don't want anything new. And uh, I had to fight my way through that. And finally, when we got the pilot project out and uh, it was a big success. And then we started auditioning all over the United States. And uh, it became popular in 63 countries around the world. Wow, you were pretty busy. How did you manage to create a public diplomacy program revolving around classical music that became popular in 63 countries around the world? How did I manage it? By doing it. You know, I mean, it's a simple concept. You take superb artists who are not famous or under management, therefore not spoiled and amenable to making sacrifices. You take the best of them and make them cultural ambassadors overseas. And through their talent and through just being themselves, they did a lot of good for the country because that's what public diplomacy is. You just show up and you be yourself and you're not pre-programmed. And if you have talent, it's even better because you make an offering and that transcends language, it transcends religion, it transcends politics. And people say, oh my gosh, America's not only interested in making bombs and, and, and acquisitiveness, they've got a good side too. I like how you phrase that by showing up and being yourself. It, mm -hmm. it gives me light of how you can bring something different into um, the world and the way you projected that. Oh, that's an easy concept is what I'm saying in answer to your question, because everybody wins. Mm -hmm. so it's a low budget because these artists did not insist on a big fee in, in return for a scrapbook and reviews and exposure. Uh, the difficult part, and people you say, oh, what a wonderful job you have. It must be so harmonious. No, the difficult job was the politics of it. To get to start something new in a huge institution 
you know, institutions have their own evil, including corporations, because they exist for the purpose of self-perpetuation. I agree. Now, the book is described as sad, comical, and explosive. Could you elaborate on some of the humorous and intense moments that readers can expect? You know, I, there's so many. I mean, it's a continuum throughout the book. People don't know how much lunacy is in the government, really. Where you have, no, I mean, really, you have people sitting around in $1,000 suits with wingtip shoes. They have big responsibilities, a lot of power. And sometimes they say nonsense. And you can't laugh. It's like being in Sunday school, because if you start, you won't stop. And uh, and then there's the possibility that if they want to get rid of you, they'll set you up with a felony or a disgrace in the press. Oh, it's it's a ruthless environment. Wow. If you're really trying to do something, if you just sit in a cubicle and polish one piece of the mosaic and you have no windows in your office, uh, and you don't know what the big mosaic looks like, uh, you can survive, I suppose, more readily. It's a culture within a culture. It's a city within a city with its own behavioral code. You're not supposed to laugh. Uh, everybody has a very serious mean. No matter what they're doing, they all walk around like they're negotiating the ceasefire in Gaza. Wow, that's a tough crowd. In in what ways does federal pianists provide insight into how the government really works, as mentioned in the review by Gilbert K. Davis? Again, the continuum of my story. There were three elements in this very sensitive agency that reported to the White House. There were political appointees, there were civil servants, and there were diplomats in the Foreign Service. The political appointees consider themselves the torchbearers for the president's agenda, and that the bureaucracy was an enemy because they were career people who were most often slightly to the left of center. The career people considered political appointees incompetent for the most part, that they were products of the spoil system, and they were part of a giant welfare state. And uh, the Foreign Service were kind of above, thought themselves above both of them in a way. They had to deal with them. They thought they knew how. They had dealt all over the world, and they'd have to come back on rotation for duty in the United States. So they knew the world. They knew this country. They just generally thought they knew more than anybody else and walked around with uh, cufflinks and, and uh, handkerchiefs in, in their pocket of their suits. And... Um, these three elements had different agenda and did not get along in a very sensitive agency. And their weapon to keep people in line was to leak information to the press. And all three elements were good at it. I'm making this sound very lurid, but really there was so much nonsense and lunacy that I think people instinctively know something about the, you know, the government does good things, right? It protects us national security, defense. It's a guarantor of individual liberties, but people instinctively know there's something quite not right. And this, it's never been personalized, really. And this book does through my own experiences, I think. Well, that's good that we get to read more about it when we dive into the book. Now, as a former political appointee, what were some of the unique challenges you faced in the highly political and bureaucratic world of Washington, D.C.? Oh, when you're a political appointee, your friends and enemies are made the minute you walk in the door. That's particularly, tough. Particularly if you come from the top banana, if he's the one that brings you in. Because his link is to the president. Wow. Now, what do you hope readers will take away from reading your book? Do you have a message or lessons you want to convey? No, I just hope that, uh, no, it's not a message book and it's not a tell-all book. It's, a, it's mostly, mostly truthful. Most of it is truthful. And, and as I say, I tweaked the last two chapters. I, I want the reader to be entertained. 
first of all. This is not a textbook on government, and this is not a boring thing. It's, it's a Jonathan Swift thing. Gulliver travels to an exotic place, except the place is, is the government. So I want them to be entertained, and as a sidecar, I think it's also informative. Can you share a bit about your experience as an international concert pianist and how it influenced your writing of Federal Pianist? Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, as well, it, it didn't, I mean, I am what I am and, and I wrote the, the musical portions uh, already having had experience in playing by that time. I was, an I, I was a cultural ambassador for the United States while I was directing this program. So I played overseas then. So uh, just everything I knew and everything that I am went into the book. That's, that's how I can explain it. I, I, you know, I, I mean, not, no chapters in the key of B flat. And how did your background in music and the arts shape your perspective on the intersection of arts and foreign policy? Oh, because 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 public diplomacy is part of, of 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 foreign policy, and music and the arts can be used as a conduit, as a crucible through which public diplomacy can be brought to the world. As I explained earlier, it's an offering the United States makes through artists, musicians, uh, cinematographers. Uh, and any aspect of, of the arts that takes you out of your mundane existence and, and, and gives you a sense of joy. Now, what made you decide to write a novelized account of your experiences rather than a straightforward memoir? I wrote that novel because I could tweak the ending. A straightforward narrative has no ending except that it's over. But a novel always has to have an ending. And so I tweaked that. And I tweaked a few other things in the book I, uh, as well, but but very little. It's it's 95% true, as I say in the introduction. And even where I tweaked it, uh, it had to do with I knew the characters involved, their personalities, and how they would interact if, in fact, that scene had happened, and it, and it well could have. In other words, scenes we'd like to see. Is there a particular scene or chapter in the book that you are most proud of or that holds special significance to you? Not really. It's a continuum. I think it's, it's a compelling book. It charges along the way to the completion of the program against all odds the success of the program, and then the culture of Washington when the administration comes to an end and everything is a dying gasp. It's an anatomy of human nature and the psychology of the power uh, done in the context of very imperfect people of which we all are, but also as in, in experiencing that, laughter really is our as our best refuge. And now there, there are a lot of readers or that aspire to be authors. Um, what advice would you offer to a new writer or shares the same genre and writing style as you? Well, I don't know if they have the same genre of writing style, but um, I would tell them to write what they know about, particularly at the beginning, write what you know about. And if you construct any characters in fiction, Make sure there's somebody that you know that you can describe in a very personal way. That makes it a lot easier, right? Um, where can readers buy your book? Do you have a website where we can find more information about you and your book? Well, there's a website on um, Amazon and amazon.com. All they have to do is key in my last name or the title of the book. There's a synopsis of the book and there are 27 reviews so far, most of them I'm happy to say are five star. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I know this is your first time collaborating with Bookmark Alliance. Could you please share your experience? Your feedback will help us improve our services and better serve authors. What I would tell a lot of people today, and that is, if you have a process, and it's good to have one, it's a framework. 
but don't be afraid to get out of the process and think out of the box. Don't let somebody come along with an idea that doesn't quite fit in into the process. Don't let that flummox you explore the possibility. And number two, uh, don't assume anything. Always follow through. Don't say, oh, so-and-so has that purview, so I'm sure they'll take care of it. Well, thank you, John. Um, it was great getting to know more about you. And I like that you gave light to the book that you wrote. So I'm looking forward to um, talking more about this when we get to London. Good, thank you. Thank you.